Good evening, everybody. I'm rather bright. Welcome to Studio 10 Talks. Too much ring light, too much light. Uh, I'm Patrick Cassidy, the Artistic Director of Studio 10, and it has been a while since we've, we've been here. We've been doing them once a month, but we're doing live theater again, so I'm blessed about that, and that's going great. We have an incredible show tonight, um, but let's start. Oh, we're on a Tuesday night. Usually, we're on a Monday night. And that's because our guest is so successful and so busy, we had to get him on this night, and we got him. But first, I'm going to bring in our, our, our incredible producer. Please welcome, and she's got something to share, Miss Julie Garnier. Hey, Jules. Good hey, it's great you. to see you. You always have the better background than I do because you're. Oh, doing well, you don't. I mean, my studio is in my bedroom in my apartment here in Los Angeles. Nobody wants to see what's going on behind me. Just so, so the CGI thing that you're able to do from home is a, it's a good thing. I get it. You look great. It's a, it's imperative. How have you been? How's your how's your week been? It's been like a month since we've done this. A little over. I know. Um, this has been a very exciting week. It's been yeah. really really exciting. Um, yeah. Tell me why, uh, or tell uh, tell tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> so th uh, throughout the pandemic and a little bit before. Um, one of my dearest friends, uh, Michael, actor Michael Kostroff from HBO's The Wire and Broadway's The Nance, Les Mis, producers. The producers, he's, yeah, I know. Yeah, he's yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, of course. Uh, he and I wrote a book together, and uh, we got the books this week. Um, our beautiful publisher, uh, Roman and Littlefield, sent us a big box of books, and it's official. I've, I'm an author. I'm a We're new author. author. That's um, New, York, new York Times bestseller. Here we come. I hope so. Uh, I, I do want to tell you, I have a little surprise for you. Okay. Uh, I, I would getting, like you to... I'm getting a book from Amazon right now? <laughs> no, actually, I've already mailed one to you. Okay. But I, yeah. But I would like to introduce to you my friend, Michael Kostroff. Oh, my God. Hello, Michael <laughs> Kostroff. How are you? That is a big surprise. I've never been the surprise guest before. This is like, this is a milestone. I can check I this you, I hope you have a lot of material ready. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations to the both of you. Let me tell you, we're really super excited. Uh, you know, it was how many years ago, Julie? No. Uh, five. Well, 2017 what? was when you had the idea. <laughs> I said, Julie, you know, there isn't a handbook for stage actors, like to learn all this stuff that we're supposed to know. Look oh, at that. Stage Fancy graphics. Traditions, protocols, and etiquette for the working and aspiring professional, Michael Kostroff and Julie Garnier. Oh, that's, and forwarded by Jeff Daniels. And I believe also you have Jason Alexander at, at the end, right? Oh, we, really we have about. quotes from Phoebe Newworth, Jason Alexander, Cheetah Rivera, Patrick Stewart. Sir, Sir Patrick, a couple of hacks, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No Come one legendary at all. You know, it's it's so funny. I, I don't recall my, my phone ring, ringing for for a quote. Uh, but anyway, uh, must have the wrong number. There it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, guys, I, I I can't tell you. Congratulations! I can't wait wait to, wait to read it, Julie. And uh, I, God knows, I said this to Julie. I wish I had had that handbook when I started. The mistakes I would have saved. Oh us. my God. I, I, I would have saved myself a lot of embarrassment. Oh, my God. The number of times I stepped in it. I'm surprised anybody still works with me because I. I, I... <laughs> well, come back. Come back again to the show. We'll do we'll do we'll do more of an interview with you. I'd love to talk to you. for Anytime. Any I think I'm going to have to interview the both of you next time. It's just about the book and and all and all the things the book will teach us. We do that. We do okay. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michael, and great to see you. you. To we're we're going to be doing a book signing at the Drama Bookshop in New York City. Oh, what's what's the date? Sunday, July seventeenth. Sunday, July seventeenth. The stage at actors' five. handbook. At five come, p.m. Come meet Michael. Come meet Julie, and come get it signed, and then read it and become a better actor. <laughs> nice Thanks, to see Michael. you, Patrick. Great to see you. Thank you for coming on. Great to see you. Pleasure. Hi, my friend. Take me out. Like, all right, Jules. I'll see you in a little bit. Let's let's get to uh, the guy. You know, he's he's on a clock. This man. I know. We got it. We got to get right to yeah, him. Probably. So I'm gonna head out. Have a great show. All right. So our guest tonight. I am so excited to talk with him. As you will get to hear him. Uh, 
Stephen Pasquale is an American actor and singer. He is best known on Broadway for originating the, ro the role of Robert in Bridges of Madison County and on television for his role as the New York City firefighter EMT Sean Garrity in the series Rescue Me. He made his TV debut on the HBO series Six Feet Under playing a love interest for David. He has also starred in the film Aliens vs. Predator. Uh, Requiem and as Scott in American Son on both stage and screen. Please welcome Mr. Stephen Pasquale. Hello. <laughs> Hello to you. Welcome, my friend. How are you? I'm great, man. How are you? I, it always it always is interesting to me. I'm sort of like, which credits do they choose when they introduce you? Ah, this way, this time it's Brad Bridges of Madison County and American Son. Good call. Nice choices. With all those, oh, good, good. See, we get the thumbs up on those. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Too well, there's a lot. To, like, there's a lot to pull from. There's sometimes they're like, you might know him from this piece of crap, <laughs> or this other piece of crap. <laughs> yes, so it's I better when they're. It's better when it's the good things. I, I totally agree. Uh, so I want to start with just you, your upbringing and stuff. Uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania. You grew up in, in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, born in, uh, just. Uh, adjacent to Maplewood, New Jersey, oh, and cool. raised in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Yeah, moved. My to mom. My mom is from Pennsylvania. Okay, what part? Pittsburgh. I was just going to say. So, does she say, um, "Yun's got to go and do the wash"? <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever heard Shirley Jones talk like that? I haven't. <laughs> oh my god, I forgot your mom is Shirley Jones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she doesn't actually have a t even a. T Touch of that Pittsburgh accent. No, it's, it was all that good Pittsburgh playhouse upbringing. She was yeah, trained, they trained very well. It, they trained it right out of here. Because that but was, I, wait, I Patrick, that. wait, that Western Pennsylvania accent, which Shirley Jones, of course, does not have, is not cute. Oh, it's not? No, it, one, it is one of the ugliest dialects on planet Earth, bar none. Oh, really? And I'm from Pennsylvania, so I can say it. Okay. <laughs> Did, tell me, by the way, tell, your, your last name, what is the origin of your last name? It's Italian, Pasquale. Um, so, so it's not, yeah, because people have people called you Pasquale. Have, have, have that yeah, people often to say Pasquale or Pascal because uh, they mix them up, but it's really just Pasquale. We sort of Americanized it. It's Italian. It's uh, my father's uh, origin is from a little village near the north, um, nearest major city, Milan, a little village called Pietra Catella, where mm -hmm. I believe. Everyone, everyone is named Pasquale, either first or last. Oh, there are. You, uh, you went to Bishop uh, McDevitt High School, right? And you. Whoa, Patrick! I'm You're taking my, me back to oh, my, my, my work, Steve. This is like James Lipton. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start crying. So. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, you, so you went, so you went to Bishop McDevitt, and uh, and you are. I did. Now let me see if I know this. Were you a jock? Sports. Yes, you've done your Wikipedia homework. I was a jock too. I was one okay. of those. I was a quarterback, and like, like that was my thing. Okay. And I, and I was also a drama guy. So I was one of, at a time when people didn't do both, but I did, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I sort of found both. I got hurt actually, and I couldn't, and I was just down for the count. And a buddy of mine was like, you know, come and do the play. That's um, exactly what happened to me. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was really fun, and I like. I found that theater people were so, I just loved how they sort of embraced each other and like let the freak flag fly. And there was no like pecking order. And I just was really drawn to it. And so that was the beginning of my love of theater people. What position did you play? I was a free safety and a quarterback. Oh, that's, oh my God. Like that's, I was a quarterback. And then up, up until my sophomore year, I was the free safety of the quarterback. And then they focused me just on quarterback. But uh -huh. I broke my collarbone and the musical theater, uh, the drama department was doing the music man, which my mother, you know, had a little part in the movie. Uh -huh. Right, your mother, mother from Pittsburgh. Your mother yes. was like, I'm the music man. Did you guys do the wash? <laughs> so who were you in the music man? I auditioned for Harold Hill and I got cast as salesman number five. Nice. Do you have <laughs> yeah. to be in the quartet if you're salesman number five? No, Constable Lock. I got to play Constable Lock, but I got bit by the theater bug. I came back to return. I returned to play the last two games of the season. I, by the way, after the first two games of the season, when I got hurt, I was leading the nation in passing. I got hurt, changed the trajectory of my career, 
and I've been doing it ever since. Leading the nation in passing, Jesus. I was, I was, I was, I was to go like playing college and stuff. That, I'm, that's what I'm saying. It, it literally that had the injury not happened, I would have probably done that, and hopefully, you know, w- would have not gotten hurt worse, but probably would have because college football is tough. I always, you know, I don't know how. Knowing what we know now, I don't know how truly how parents like let their kids play football. Right. And I say that through such gritted teeth because I love it. It's an amazing game and I love it. And you're a Notre Dame fan, right? You love I'm Notre, a Notre Dame. Dame fan. My dad went to Notre Dame, yeah. Wow. Although I'm an anti, although I'm a little bit of not a fan of Catholicism, I'm a huge fan of Notre Dame. Right. Um, so we watch the football uh, program with, you know, vigor uh, right. every year. <laughs> Because of my dad's loyalty, but you know, how do you let your kids play this game that we know now is so so dangerous? No, so I, dangerous. I, I agree. I was I was happy that my 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 my, my older son uh, tried to play, and uh, and he didn't have the speed and he didn't have the size. And I said, and he said, and he and he and he went, Dad, I don't think this is for me. And I was like, perfect. Right. And you were Tell like, about- be in the play. You said you can just be in the play. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about your. Uh, very first job that you ever got ever or as an actor as an actor i did the complete works of william shakespeare at a little theater company in my hometown um oh my god i'm gonna forget the name of it. and i got paid 330 bucks for the entire run it was like eight weeks oh um, uh and that was the first like time i was like ever had a real job and was paid as an actor and i was like oh my god 330 bucks this is feels amazing but if i boiled it down to the hour it's like i don't know 50 cents an hour or something incidentally i i got that when i did assassins but we'll talk about that yeah. later <laughs> i got that at playwrights i got that exact same by the way you know it's funny uh, our salaries haven't gone up since you did assassins since oh really you- true <laughs> <laughs> oh is that depressing but okay <laughs> right, yeah. um uh and your first broadway show reasons to be pretty yes Yep, Neil LeBute's Reasons to be Pretty. Look at that. Yeah. I prepare for the one and only Piper Perabo. I don't, I don't, I forget what I'm yelling in that moment, but I know that I said fuck more than any other actor ever said fuck on Broadway. So you, has the record been broken? We, or maybe it was we said fuck in that play more than any other play in Broadway history. It was like 1,300 times or something. Now, was when you were doing Reasons to be Pretty, was this? Uh, was it because because I this is what blew me away when I was listening sort of listening to your 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 music stuff. You did an album, right? Called something like Love, a jazz album. I did a jazz album around the same time. Uh, I think this is like oh eight with John Pizzarelli. Oh my God, look at that picture. That's absurd. Brian Darcy James calls this cover album the Scarf. <laughs> He goes, hey, I was listening to your album the other day. Isn't it called the Scarf? <laughs> well, we uh, have a, we have a little a little soundbite. We have a little uh, one little thing we're gonna play for you. Okay, okay. Ready? So, because I, I want I want something like the first time it snows, something like Saturday clothes, something like movies with Groucho. Day on the couch, oh, something like love, something like love. Oh, okay. Wow, that's pretty good, dude. I, it's ridiculously good. So here's, I, I mean, I wanted everybody to hear that, but what struck me, Stephen, and I'm, I'm really serious about that. I'd never heard you sing in any way like that. I've heard you sing musical theater. Uh-huh. And I was like, how do you, is there anything you can't sing? Because if you can sing like that, and you can sing like other things that we're going to show and, and listen to, I, I, I mean, did you ever consider going into opera? I, I can sort of make myself sound a little bit like an opera singer. It's all been a little bit of a, imp, of an impression. Like I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit doing an impression of a Broadway singer or an impression of an opera singer or an impression of a, of a jazz singer. And so I feel like I can kind of escape into that, like thinking a little bit. And then I don't, 
And then I truly feel like I can kind of make myself sound like whatever is needed. And and what you're saying, because I, I know this just because when we spoke right before we started uh, uh, filming, you think of things, you're, you're an actor who sings, right? Would you say, would you sort of qualify yourself like that? Yeah, hundred percent actor yeah. first. Yeah, that's how that's how I thought. I never because there were guys. Now there's nobody that can sing circles around you, but there were guys that could sing circles around me. So I said, <laughs> well, if I can act better than them. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> well, I thought you know, I, I I feel like my when I first started, I feel like maybe I started working because people thought I was a, a pretty good singer. Uh, but I really didn't want. I wanted to actively. And no offense to anybody who's done this, avoid being an actor who does like 35 years of Phantom and Les Mis and Phantom sure. and Les Mis and Miss Saigon. And, you know, I really wanted to do like Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams and, you know, Stephen Sondheim and mm -hmm. Adam Gettle and all that other shit. So it was like kind of, it was a real active, it was a real active choice. And you, and you wanted to do plays. I mean, you wanted to do, you didn't want to just be a musical theater thing. I've spoken to a lot of, a lot of guys that just, they, you know, Terry Mann used to talk about that. He used to say, you know, because Terry's a terrific actor, but he got kind of locked into this musical theater thing. And yeah. um, and then it's always, oh, well, it can't do a play. Well, yes, he can. He's a great actor. He's great. I was just in a workshop with him a few weeks ago, and he literally, like, brought the room to its feet. That's a great American actor. Like, people should hire him to do plays. 100%. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Bridges a little bit. Bridges in Madison County, it was it, that was your first Broadway musical? Yes. <clears throat> yes. I had done um, a couple of off-Broadway musicals and a few like Broadway tours. Um, there I am wearing a woman's uh, blouse, clearly. <laughs> 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 Kelly, Kelly, Kelly colored her hair for that, didn't she? she was just yeah, well, she was wearing a, she was wearing this beautiful wig. She gets, the, I mean, I don't know what Carol O'Hara does, but she gets the best wigs, man. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, just to give Kelly a shout out, she gave birth to her, I think that baby was, I'm not exaggerating, five weeks old when we had our first rehearsal or performance. Really? Week. This really? is a woman who's like breastfeeding on every break. Uh, I mean, she is like, if there is, if there are Navy SEALs in American <laughs> entertainment, Kelly O'Hara is the captain of the fucking Navy. <laughs> she is the best. Uh, I, I was, uh, I, before she became the mega Kelly O'Hara, I did a little uh, a musical thing with her that um, um, David um, Maltby Shire wrote called uh, Take Flight. And I got to oh, see sure. her. Yeah, it was great. She was great. Um, so I, I, had you seen the film when you, did the, when you did the show? Or did you ever watch the film? You know what? The film is quite good. Um, and the book is like really bad. So um, mm -hmm. it was like this weird idea for a musical because I thought if people associate it with the book, it's really kind of sloppy. And uh -huh. if they associate it with this Clint Eastwood movie, it's kind of this beautiful character driven thing. But I, I really believe that Jason and Mar Jason Robert Brown and Marsha Norman created the best version of this source material uh, that has ever been. And they changed it. I mean, I've never seen it. And I, lo I love the album. I, lo I mean, I love the music, but I've never actually seen it. But they changed it dramatically. I mean, just by, the, by your ages. Right. I mean, yeah. you guys, you're much younger. Than well, I'm, I'm a lot more. It's a lot more honoring what the book was, which is like, I mean, he's. I think it's vague, but he's like a person who's like in his 40s, maybe. Right. right. And I was, I think, 37. So I was a little young. But, you know, Clint Eastwood was like 75. I, I know. I know. I know. I know. I want to I want to show um, our uh, our viewers a, a piece of it. This is uh, Mr. Stephen Pascal singing. Oh, I'm this. so excited for this. <laughs> eternal that cannot be torn apart there is one thing that remains forever true past the thinking past the breathing past the beating of my heart it will Oh! 
back, man. I haven't looked at that in a long time. Seeing, seeing Jason Robert Brown and our music director, Tom, and Justin playing that mandolin. You know what? That, Jason Robert Brown is a genius. Genius. Kind of genius. genius. I'm, I'm talking to him right now. He's supposed to do the next Studio 10 Talks. <laughs> right? Oh, is he good? Yeah, yeah. he is. Because I, I, I got him right before. Right when I was talking with you, I, I, I got him on the thing, and he said, he said, yeah, let me just get through the Tony Awards. I'll get through the Tony Awards. And then, said, yeah, so I'm dying to talk yeah. to him, too. I, I, I mean, have, I, you ever, have you ever met his wife or worked with his wife? Yes, know her well and love her dearly. She's They're phenomenal, amazing. too. So phenomenal. They're an um, awesome family. And working on Jason's music was like, I don't know, maybe uh, alongside working on Early Light in the Piazza, which I did, uh, were, were two of those moments where I was like, I could just do this literally forever if if people would buy tickets. I that, would. That, now, that's right. You did like before in seattle is that correct yeah i was like i worked on it originally like when it was just no no lyrics when it was just adam brilliantly like humming and singing along what would eventually became lyrics so i did like the original sundance workshop and i did the original workshop in adam's apartment in new york and then the, the per first full production at the intimon theater in seattle and then another workshop in adam's apartment in new york and then i uh I got a television series and I started having to, you know, pay my bills. Yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they, some those those times when you're making that money and paying your bills, you sometimes don't get to do those wonderful, creative, artistic things that we all want to do. You know, it's funny. I teach this class at the NYU grad acting program called The Real Life of Acting, mm -hmm. where we talk about things that are not process related. Your process is your own. This is about like things I've learned because I didn't wasn't taught and lessons I've learned on the job. Etc. And the one of the big lessons that I always feel like they come away with is, in my experience, the thing that is super fulfilling and makes you feel like you're a living an artist's life and makes you want to go to work every minute of every day is usually not the thing that pays you really well. Yeah. <laughs> and the, when when you can get two happening at this, that those two things happen at the same time, it's a dream, but it's just rare. Oh, you're very you're right. I mean, that's why to me, the amazement. Of, of a Hamilton, which is, yeah. the, you know, the, the commercial at the highest level and the artistic and credibility and, at, at the highest level, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah like you know? that's, yeah, like that was so good. I, yeah. could, I could do that show for a, a whole year without, you know. So, um, I, so I got to do, and I'm blessed to, have years and years, I was 23 when I did 24, I got to do the Robert Bridegroom. Oh, okay. Yeah, not too many people, you know, get a chance to, to do it and, or even know it at this point. I have a bunch of things I have to ask you. Um, first of all, how was the experience for you at the roundabout? Terrific. Alex Timbers had an incredible vision for it. Justin Levine, like, really rethought the music. We massaged all the sort of crusty, problematic moments and turned them into sort of like funny contemporary things that worked. And it was one of the funniest group of humans I've ever been around. It was in incredibly gratifying, with the exception of our hometown newspaper wasn't as kind, and so therefore we we you know we, really it didn't get it, now. But that uh, and you wanted didn't you win like the Lucille Lortel award for it? Lucille for Lortel, yeah, that's the, right. That's, that's right. And they, and I heard. I mean, I didn't get to see it. I would have. I, I was out of town. I, I was doing something, and I couldn't get to New York. I wanted to see it so bad. They. So my the thing I wanted. How did they deal with Love Stolen? How did they deal with that whole thing? Um, how did we deal with Love Stolen? Oh, it, it it definitely became not about as written originally being a woman being blonked on the head and then right. like passed out and taken advantage of. Right. You can't. can't it was more yeah. like it was more like sneaking a kiss under the tree, or sneaking a. You know, oh, it was okay. As and, did, and did Alfred Yuri work on it? I mean, was was he? A part yeah, Alf, Alf, um, Alfred and Alex Timbers got together and really tried to sort of massage some of that old stuff that was, you know, from the original like folklore, and obviously super problematic. I'm working with a kid that was in it. He's going to do a show for us called Smoke on the Mountain. Uh, Douglas Teeman, uh, the fiddle player. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, those guys. Awesome. He lives here. He lives here. Yeah, I, I love that show. I love that score. I want to do it at Studio Ten. I think it would be it would go over great. Yeah, uh, it really would. It's also really it has the potential to be really funny. Oh yeah, and it's and the part is great. How did they deal with you? Did they do any stuff with, with the berry? Yeah, we put the black we put the uh, blackberry juice. Uh huh. 
and then I just had to kind of like wash it off uh, every night. But we did it as it was as if it were sort of like a streak, sort of like hiding in the night. Oh, it's great! It's great. Yeah. Um, carousel. Uh huh. So you know, That's my mom, my mom did that one too. <laughs> Yeah, your mom is like kind of everywhere, man. She's got her she's got her DNA on all the good shit, huh? Yeah, she does. She, well, if you say, okay, she was Lori in Oklahoma, she was Julie in Carousel, and she was marrying the librarian in the music. Now, those are three pretty good musical movies. It's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. So, you guys said it in the fifties. Is that what happened? You you were in the it was no, it was uh, it was early. It was early nineteen. It was early uh, turn of the century. Oh, it was. Um. Yeah, just kind of like just before the like kind of flapper uh, days of the twenties. Yeah. Um, is that Charlotte yeah. Dubois? Is that Charlotte? It's Charlotte Dubois. Just killed it in that show. She was on this this show too. She's awesome. I, you know, Carousel is like a freakish, weird, way ahead of its time masterpiece. I didn't. I'm gonna be so embarrassed right now. I only knew of Carousel that incredible song, which is uh, Soliloquy. Mm -hmm. I did not know Carousel like every in and out of it until they asked me to do it at the Lyric Opera. And then I read it and listened to the score and really got into it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is like, I think this is a masterpiece. Yep, it is. Um, and working on that was just really, man, one of the great experiences I've ever had. It felt like a, it felt like a part that was really tailor-made for like what I love. Well, tailor-made, tailor-made for you. You have all that quality. You have all, I, I got to sing it once yeah. at, and I was... I always thought I was, I never got to play Curly, but I always thought I was a better Curly than mm -hmm. a Billy. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, the, and what made me good as Curly is what night made, but I, for some reason, based on all the work I've seen you do, I got I would have loved to have seen you do Billy because it's a good part. It's really right for yeah, you. Yeah, man. It's because Billy's fucked up. Scorpio's, man. Curly's a nice guy. Curly's kind of sweet. Kind of, yeah, shallow and kind of <laughs> earnest and noble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to, I want to play the fucked up guy. <laughs> Well, okay. well. Let's speaking of what was it like singing the soliloquy in front of an audience? Oh man, um, maybe the single most uh, thrilling m musical experience I've I've had in my life. Because at the lyric we had, I'm not exaggerating. I think 80 musicians. Oh my god! Or something, and it was like a 5,000 seat house. So. The acting was gone, forget it. They were watching like an ant on the stage. <laughs> yeah, right. The sound was incredible. And to just be able to pretend to be like just a singer in that house with those musicians, it felt it was pretty it was pretty thrilling. So we play a little game on this show, Stephen. Uh -huh. I played it with everybody. I got to do it with Kelly and, and Patty and Krista, everybody. And uh, it's called Remember the Lyric. Okay. No, oh, I hate this game already. <laughs> oh, you're love this game. Adam, Adam Gettle played this game great with you. You're gonna love this game. Yeah, great. but Adam's like a kind of a genius, right? Yeah, I definitely yeah. don't remember my lyrics. So, but let's do I, it anyway. Okay, we're gonna have fun. So it's this is a song that you sang from a show that you did. And why did. not why? <laughs> no. no. Oh, is that wait, is that from I'm stolen? No, 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 not love stone. No, Rock steel is style. Does it scream out my guesses? No, no, yeah. Don't blow your voice out because I'm gonna need just a little of it. Okay, so, right. so uh, this from a song, a show you did, song you sang, and um, and I'll what I'll do is I'll sing a piece of it, and then I'll point to you, and then you sing back at me. Okay. And the idea we'll is that I remember the correct lyric. Ex exactly. Are you ready? Great. So this is they might as well re-entitle the game. Embarrassing <laughs> Steve. Here's our note. No, no. I've got to get ready before she comes. It's too high. Jesus, what are you like doing the, the doing the is that it? Doing the voice uh, of I, piano version? Yeah. I've got to get ready before she comes. I've got to make certain that she won't be dragged up in slums by a lot of bombs like me. I think it's still too much of a tenor key, but that's about how it comes next. <laughs> She's gotta be sheltered. Oh, that's what it was. I'm sorry. She's she's gotta be sheltered and fed and dressed in the best that money can buy. I never knew how to make money, but I'll try. My God, I'll try. I'll go out and make 
it or steal it or take it. How long is the show? Just an hour? <laughs> or die. <laughs> no! I think you just did the best remember the lyric ever. Yeah. Although, come on, that's like that was pretty. Like that's not, that's not that obscure. I thought you were going to try to trick me. No, I no, I, I I don't know you well enough yet. I wanted to make I wanted to make it a. Yeah, that was awesome. And okay, I, let me let's, was, let's let's turn the tables here, Patrick. Okay. What comes after this? Um, Johnny Booth was a headstrong fellow. Even he believed the things he said. Oh, man, that's a pretty good memory. That's 30, 40 years ago, huh? Yeah, 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 okay. okay yeah. I'm, I'm more impressed. I'm more impressed. Uh, well, now, now since you sang it so beautifully here, ladies and gentlemen, you heard Mr. <laughs> you heard Mr. Basketball sing this. Listen to this. Patrick, wait, first of all, I have to say two things about that. One, that filming is the first time we were ever on that tall ass like bridge where that song was oh, being sung, which is why right. the song, I have to apologize for the bad acting. I, in the middle of the song, I look a little bit like, am I gonna fall? <laughs> this really hard shit, but am I gonna fall? Cause I was just standing 12 feet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing is that was just like a, a, like a zitz probe orchestra rehearsal so i literally finished that song and there's no one in the audience so it's like Die! <laughs> dead silence nobody clapping nobody yeah. cares i guess i'll go eat worms it's the but I, okay now here's here comes one of the four thousand compliments that i want to show <laughs> tell you uh, you know gordon mccray was my my brother sean's godfather knew john Wright very well I think you sing it better than both of them. Well, I know I acted better than both of them. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder Adam Dettel loves you so much. You have, you I mean, have. Those are some pretty great singers. But yeah, but I know it was acted better. Than your before. performance is staggering. I'm so sorry I didn't get to see you. See you oh, you're nice, that. man. You know what? Oh. Once in a while, you just get to play a part that feels tailor made, and that uh, that was like one of the very few times I felt like. Boy, I understand this. This how to play this, you know. But that's so nice of you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we now get to talk about assassin. So it's going to make me cry. You got to do it twice, right? You did it for that's encores right. first. Yeah, I did it for Annie Kaufman at encores in God, I don't remember, two thousand like seventeen or eighteen, maybe. Um, and then two seasons later for John Doyle at CSC, but about two weeks into that rehearsal process, COVID hit. So we were delayed for, you know, another year and a half. We finally got to it this past fall at CSC wow. where, 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 where you came. Yeah. It was extraordinary. <clears throat> Thank you, man. I, I cried, you know, it's, you know, it's, we know, I mean, that show, I mean, I know so much about, you know, the history of it, you know, at one point before the 2004 revival, they were about to do it on Broadway. Yeah. I remember. And that's when 9-11 uh, happened. Yeah. And, and Doug Sills was supposed to play Booth. And, and uh, oh, there you are again. Yeah, this production was so great. Anyway, they finally got it on Broadway. And, and, and that was a huge thing, you know, for, for both John and Steve. And, mm -hmm. But I was so excited. And I went with Adam Gettle, as you know. And I, and I came to see the show. And, it had, and I'd spoken to John Doyle when he did the Studios and Talk. And it was extraordinary. Thanks. It was so good. I cried. 
I mean, the, the thought of me at somebody crying at assassins, I, I mean, I got so teary during the, the Booth ballad. Well, you know, I, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I adore Victor, uh, Victor Garber very much. And I think, I don't know if you guys came on the same day, but you were very close. Very. And I just remember in terms of when you overlapped. Oh, you the show. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And I just remember thinking, God, what is it like for, I just wanted to be so good because I was playing Booth and he had played Booth. And I remember thinking, what is it like for him to watch this thing that he knew was a masterpiece, but people weren't ready for it. And so they were walking out. I mean, you guys know, like it was, people thought it was unpatriotic or whatever. They were afraid, petrified actually. Yeah. And to watch it now in this environment, in this moment in America, we are where we are really saying out loud, this country's got some warts. And this is MAGA before there was MAGA. You know, well, it, just had more, it just had more power than it's ever had. I, 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 and that's what I think, too. And, I, you know, you know, one of the things that John asked me to do was that you guys did, um, CSC did, you know, your, your, your thing about assassins, where you talked about it was to raise money, fundraiser. Well, we had done one, too, on Studio 10 Talks, which was the 30th anniversary of the 1991 uh, cast. Mm -hmm. And I, Steve did the show. And so mm -hmm. did John, and Victor was on, and Jury Zacks, and Paul Gemignani, all those people, the whole cast was on. It was an amazing thing for me and for this. Um, and I talked, and I and, and Julie was so great, she cut together this piece of where John and Steve talk about make, uh, making the show, how they created it. So watch this for a second. Um, this was an unusual case. We talked about the show for months, and then John was reluctant to show me any given scene at a time. Yeah. He said, just wait a bit. And then one day he sent over uh, virtually a completed script. And I've said this many times in public and I'll say it again. Reading that script up here in Connecticut was, I guess, the most exciting moment I've ever had in writing. Oh. It was, I actually started yell into an empty room. I oh. just thought, <laughs> Pretty cool. I Did love you, both of those guys a lot, but I have a real super soft spot for John Weidman. So to hear Steve, who we all uh, literally bend the knee to, rave that much about Weidman, it's so it's so happy making. And you know, you know, Stephen, he always did. I mean, I I remember him talking because you know, like uh, 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 Robert Bargram, the critics were not kind to us. When, uh, specifically, Frank Rich at the time was the head critic of the New York Times. And he completely missed it, thought that the guys were glorifying it with the total opposite. He was saying, pay yeah. attention, look at what's going on. And yeah. your production, to me, is so much more relevant. I said that on that show. To the, What it means now, to me, is so much more relevant and so yeah. much scarier, actually. But also, um, Silky Segue, our, our hometown paper, even with our production, uh, the, that critic beat it up. Laura Collins Hughes. She was. She totally missed the boat. She didn't understand what we were doing at all. And so that's your production and my production, both beat up by our hometown paper. Wow. We could have used, we could have used that uh, support, you know. Steve and but I'll, I we I my mom and I actually af, after the thing the review had come out, we sat with Steve at his apartment and he said, he said I'm only worried about John. He said, I, I, you know, this because John at that time hadn't had that many successes or, or, mm -hmm. or, or failures for that matter. But he was so he all he cared about was what John thought. Yeah. Weidman, yeah. man. Genius. Imagine that my, my, most of the narrative and all of the weird, you know, sometimes work in Assassins is some of his best without question. And he mm -hmm. is our Shakespeare. And we could talk about that for 10 hours. Mm -hmm. But what Weidman did, it, the seed of it and the episodic nature of it is really Weidman's genius. And the, the monologues, I mean, the, the, the big <laughs> monologues are soliloquies. They are, yeah. they're, they're just incredible. His, I agree with you. I, 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 I want to produce it so badly here. You know, uh, I just thought, <clears throat> how brave to have the world's, planet Earth's greatest composer lyricist as your partner. And when it gets to the 11 o'clock number in the show, which is Lee Harvey Oswald, in the, in the uh, book depository of the John Wilkes Booth, and you don't have a song, you just decide to make it a 20 page, like kitchen sink, Arthur Miller scene. Like yeah. that's the fucking weirdest and most genius decision I've ever been around. I, I agree, <laughs> I, I, I agree. And I, I got to do Booth in LA after after the original production. So I got to, and I wanted to do it not, for nothing else, just to play that scene, which sure. was on the album. They put the scene on the album because it was so good. Yeah, well, you know, how do you think I, 
became drawn to assassins was listening to Victor Garber, you know, play that scene. That's how I became so drawn to boot. Um, let's talk about your TV stuff. Pretty successful guy, Mr. Stephen. Listen, man, I'm trying to pay the rent, brother. Rescue, rescue me, John Garrity. There yeah. you are. Well, you know, okay, you've defined the word hunk, a hunk in a firefighter's outfit. That's pretty good. Well, that's nice of you. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you know, yeah. I like playing a guy named Garrity. I'm also Irish, so I liked, I liked getting to play a guy named Garrity, a dumb Irish guy named Garrity. That was <laughs> And that was how did you like working with Dennis? I loved him. <clears throat> we got along great, man. He's a, he's a he's a very funny guy, uh, and we had a great vibe. He and I. Now, did you sing in this show? Was it a singing thing no. too? No, it was a drama slash oh. comedy. Oh, although okay. deep into the run, I think they gave me an episode where I had like a singing, maybe a singing. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah, because I because I looked at because because I I thought I thought we saw. Wait, let's bring Julie back on. Julie, come back on for a second. Julie, where are you? There she is. Jules, didn't you pull me up an episode where, where Steven's singing in that thing? Yeah, yeah. You've yeah. got three musical episodes, actually. What? My memory is amazing. What are you even talking about? <laughs> there are three episodes, three separate episodes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think my character is like in a coma. And I have these little visions. With the nurses. That's right, that's and right. Jen Colella was one of the nurses. Ah! <laughs> I know, if we, we'd we love to show it, but unfortunately with uh, YouTube, they make us pull that stuff off, so we, we wouldn't oh be able to show God, it. They shut us down. But yeah, if you wanna, be, if you wanna have your mind blown, I, I was like, oh, that is a very, very baby Jen Colella. <laughs> but if you wanna know how freakishly weird an actor's brain is, one of the fantasies, it was a song called How Lovely to Be a Vegetable because Sean Garrity was in a yep. native state. And the first word, I just will never forget Peter Tolan writing, How Lovely to Be a Vegetable. Um, how, uh, 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 cucumbive or potative. <laughs> the first two lyrics of that song. <laughs> and there were, there were, dancing vegetables happening too. Yes. There was like someone dressed as a potato and someone dressed as a carrot. Yeah, like rock rockets. Yes, yeah, it Rockets happened. You're taking me back, man. Thanks, Jules, appreciate it. Thanks for jumping in. Um, yeah, there was a show done, you know, in that Stephen Boschko, who did Hill Street Blues and LA Law, he did a show called Cop Rock in the 90s that was a, a drama courtroom uh, thing with musical numbers. It sounds uh, terrible. Yeah, well, I kept thinking that's what Rescue Me was. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I mean, not terrible, but that it was this sort of drama with musical numbers. Yes, that's what we were going for with Rescue Me, Patrick. The cop rock of <laughs> FX's uh, slate. We're, we're trying to make sort of a firefighter version of cop rock. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of dancing firefighters. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so how was it, how was it doing... Uh, I really wanted to ask this. How was it doing, Mark Furman, playing Mark Furman in in The People versus O.J. Simpson? Um, it was great because it was uh, Ryan Murphy, who knows what's uh, good and got a really good uh, finger on the pulse of what kind of stories people want to see. And uh, I thought that series was really well done and super relevant. That was kind of the beginning of us being obsessed with, you know, like celebrity as opposed to <clears throat> people who do things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, uh, I like that project a lot. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have any interest in having any contact with Mark Furman. I mean, the tapes are the tapes. He said those awful racist things. So yep, yep. Uh, I think he may have wanted to talk to me, but I have no interest in talking to him. <laughs> yeah, no, you're sure. I, I went to, I, I'll never forget. I, you might, you might find this funny. I thought I went to a Halloween party. This was probably about, I don't know, a year, two years after the whole OJ trial thing like that. Uh, and, you know, there were the various people dressed up as Superman and Batman and the Flash or whatever superhero they were. And there was this one guy in a jacket, like a sports coat and a little tie. And he had and he was just dressed very normal. And I said, and, and he had a badge on his belt. And I, I said, who are you? And he reached into his pocket and he took out a little glove and he threw it on the ground. He says, I'm Mark Furman. And he kept doing that all night. 
Like that was his, that was, oh, it was a person dressed like him. Yes, he was dressed just oh. like a conservative. And he kept going in, he had about 50 gloves that he kept yeah, yeah. going around during the party. I thought, okay, well, that's your humor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a crazy time, right? I mean, that was real, that was real. That's the guiltiest murderer ever, and he got off. Ever. Well, did you ever see, uh, did you ever read Bugliosa's book about the mountain of evidence? Uh Vincent Bugliosi, who was the prosecutor in the in the Manson uh, whole thing, mm -hmm. he wrote a book after the O.J. Simpson trial called The Mountain of Evidence. And it's all about, it's, it was undeniable. I mean, how, how they screwed it up is just ridiculous. Overwhelming evidence. It's like, it's like we're watching now with the January 6th court. It's like, are, you, are we kidding at this point? That's are right. We, if we wrote this, if we wrote these people as evil villains in a movie, it would be too much. That's right. That's right. No, it's, it's a... Tell me about, uh, you're, you're currently, you're working on The Missing, right? I'm working on two things right now. One is a show, a David Kelly show, uh, David Kelly, uh, Barry Levinson, the genius Barry Levinson, uh, sort of a thriller for Peacock called The Missing. Mm -hmm. And I'm also shooting the series finale of Robert and Michelle King's The Good Fight, which oh, is uh, one of the, great, in my opinion, one of the great streamers out there. Oh, that's great. Are you simultaneously doing both going back and forth? Um, I just finished The Missing, so now I'm, I'm focused entirely on The Good Fight, but there was a couple of days there both five. What kind of music do you like to listen to? You know what, dude? I'm getting so old and the pandemic fucked me up so good, and I had a health scare a few years ago, which kind of reframed things for me. Oh. I listen oftentimes to like what I would describe as peaceful music. Like zen, like zen music. Yeah, like zen, or like, or like some light, late night jazz kind of stuff, or like Miles Davis kind of blue, or like really old school American song, but relaxed like dinner jazz. I'm like, I don't want loud shit in my ears anymore. I'm 45. I don't know what happened, but I'm done with loud, with loudness in my ears. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. make me not cool anymore? No, it actually makes you cooler. Great. Yeah. You're, get, you're getting to really cool. That's what, When you start listening like that, that's really cool. Yeah, when you really start listening to like elevator jazz, <laughs> that's when everyone thinks you're really cool. <laughs> I want to be him. I yeah. want to listen to what he listens to. I want to watch what he watches. But you know what? I'll be more specific so that I don't sound so nerdy. I love like Max Richter, and I've been listening a ton to Garth Stevenson. Mm. Just like beautiful instrumental, not like Zen, like meditation music, just like beautiful orchestral sort of like what I would call like walk around. Yeah. Do you have, do you have a dream role role you haven't gotten to do? That you Floyd. Know? Oh, Floyd. Yeah. And I'm in Adam's ear about it a lot. Adam get our mutual friend. You should, why you have to do it. I think he likes the idea and I like the idea. I think he wants to do one, uh, another new show that he's written maybe before thinking about reviving anything. And so I feel like that. Well, they were talking to it about it because we, we, we know him. Uh, they were talking about it before the pandemic at Lincoln Center. Yeah, I think that's still an ongoing conversation. But I feel like yeah. I feel like Adam maybe wants to do one more new piece of writing before. Before they do that? Yeah, of which yeah. I've, I've been working on. And it's also genius because he's a genius, as you know. He's writing. I'm certain that he's OK with us sharing this, right? What he's working on right now? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Uh, he's, he's doing a musical version of Danny Boyle's Millions, which is yep. such yep. a good idea. And he's outdone himself with the score. And, you know, I wept, of course, the first time I heard the music. It's, he's, he's touched. He's touched like Sondheim is touched. And yep. like, he, he sang on this, on this show, he sang uh, a piece from Days of, Days of Wine and Roses. Oh, and that man. was absolutely amazing, too. I, I, mean, I mean, it just reduces you to tears. You know, he's so gifted musically that he doesn't get enough credit lyrically, but his lyrics are devastatingly good. Yep. Devastatingly good. You'd be great as Floyd, too. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put that in his ear as well. You'd be great. Do it, man. Full Tell me, I, I want to ask you, how is, your, how is your, your beautiful wife? For those who don't, don't know, Stephen is, is married to um, Philippa Sue from Hamilton. Look at that. Look at that woman getting wrangled into that mess of a man. <laughs> that is what I would call a master manipulation right there. <laughs> How did the two of you meet? Jonathan Groff set us up on a blind date. 
Oh, really? Jonathan Groff, yeah. But he said on one condition, it can't become anything. It has to be like very casual. It can't become anything. You're a mess, you're recently divorced. She's only 25. <laughs> like, don't, it just, the only condition is it can't become like a thing. That's how all the best relationships, look at you guys. That's how all the best marriages work is when they're told they can't become anything. Oh my God, can I, have, can I have some of this stuff? You would, would you like that? We will, we will send you the video. <laughs> you know what? She's great. And I'm going to shout her out right now. She's playing Cinderella in Into the Woods on Broadway for 10 yep. weeks this summer. Oh this cast, Sarah Bareilles, Gavin Creel, Patina Miller, Philip Asu, Brian Darcy James, Josh Henry. That was Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Isn't that a great company? Oh, gosh. Now, did she do it at, for uh, at Encores, too? Did she do it there, too? No, she was doing Suffs, uh, the, the musical she had just uh, was working on at the public. And uh, the, I think at City Center, it was uh, Danae Benton, right. who uh, then had to go off and shoot Gilded Age. Oh. And so uh, they asked well, me. I get, I get to, I'm going to come, see, I'm coming to New York to see it, because I, I did not see it uh, at City Center. So I'm, uh, that's, that's awesome. That's great. And the things people don't know about Pippa is because she's like, the, has the most beautiful face in the world and is a world-class singer and actor. She's also a really gifted like clown. She's very silly and very funny. And I think people will really get to appreciate that. It, have you guys gotten to perform together? We have done a few workshops together. We did a Kiss Me Kate workshop together. We've sung some duets together. But we're thinking about putting together like an evening of us because people have started to ask us to come and like do an evening like as a couple. Yeah. And, and would pay us money. And so we're like, that sounds like maybe that work is going to be worthwhile putting in that work. Well, we, I mentioned this to you before. I, you, you've thought about, people have talked to you about, but the idea of, of doing uh, your cabaret act or your one-man show, how does that feel to you? I've only done it one time ever, Patrick. And I was so young. I was like 25 or 26. I did it like a night at Joe's Pub where I sang covers and told funny stories. And at the time, it was amazing. And I loved it. And everyone clapped. And it was like, this is the best feeling in the world. And I literally have every day grown more and more like, I don't think it was really that. I think I hated it. And I don't want to do that ever again. <laughs> but it's, I think it's a block or a fear. And I need to uh, confront it. But I, like I said to you before, I like hiding in a character. I don't love being just like, hey, I'm Steve Pasquale and I'm going to sing a bunch of notes with G sharps in them. <laughs> so that you, you get your money's worth. You know, I, I hear what you're saying. And, and I was petrified of it too. The, the interesting thing is, is once I sort of got over that, it became actually more empowering being me on the stage telling these things than it ever did being a character. It, I mean, I love playing character and I still would love to do it, but for some reason, I, I, and I was afraid, I was really afraid, but after I kind of owned it and stuff like that, I said, yeah. oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm okay. I think the lesson in that is that you're braver than I am. And thank you for putting that out. And um, that doesn't hurt at all. Uh, we play, we play, you, you have. I'm getting you and, and Gettel and I together in New York. Listen, I'm sure I would find value in doing a concert by myself. <laughs> I'd feel better about myself. I'm, uh, I'm sure that's true as well. Okay. <laughs> oh, God. But I'm scared. Okay, Patrick, I'm, I'm scared. Sure I, I got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, you and I, I'm going to get the, together with you and I and Adam in New York. I'm going to put that together. I would love that. Are you kidding? That's a dangerous, um, that's a dangerous night. Tell me, tell me your most embarrassing moment on the stage. Oh, my God. In an early production of Light in the Piazza, she, uh, the uh, wind removes her hat and the guy the hat lands with her and then they meet and the story begins. And my, when I caught Celia, then Celia Keenan Bulger's hat, it, the fishing line that was used to make the hat effect work got caught on my button on my sport coat. <laughs> and so when they, when they brought the fishing line up, it was like, I was like trying to play the scene and my sport coat was like, <laughs> and it ended up kind of half, like half hanging me by the fishing line. <laughs> Uh, that's a good, that's a pretty fun. Uh, awesome. Awesome. So we play one more game on this show. Great. It's called you become the host, which means you get to ask me any one question you would like, if you have any interest to do so. <laughs> do you remember when I forgot that your mom was Shirley Jones and I asked if she sounded like she was from Pittsburgh? 
<laughs> yeah, it was. That's my question for you. It was less than an hour. It was less than an hour ago. Yeah. If I, did. I said, so does your mom say shit like Ian's and do the wash? And you were like, no, my mom is Shirley Jones. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now I remember. Um, I have a question for you. I have a serious work question. Are you ready? Yeah. Do you want to do some deep knee bends to get ready for this question? Okay, I'm ready. Because I asked this of Victor Garber as well. Were you aware, despite the poor reception and the people walking out, that Assassins was a masterpiece when it was originally being worked on? Or did you feel like maybe this doesn't work because people aren't responding and blah, blah, blah? You know, Victor and I would have a probably sort of a different view just because he was so much more established uh, as an actor at that time and so and had so much more experience at that time. I was 28 years old. And um, mm -hmm. for me, I, I, I knew I was in the midst of genius, not just obviously Steve and John, um, but the, I told you, all that cast of actors. I've never, I've never worked again with a, a greater cast, nor will I ever. They were the greatest ensemble of actors I ever had. Um, so every day was was I was just loving every moment. I knew I knew I was doing so something so incredibly great. My father had done uh, Steve's very first show. He'd done the backers auditions for Saturday Night, which was Steve's first show. He wrote music and lyrics for. So I'd had a history of growing up, and and then all of those actors. I mean Victor and, and Terry Mann and Lee Wilcoff and Annie Golden, all of them. Debbie Monk, all Terrence of them. Mann. Were, huh? Terrence Mann. Yeah, Terrence Mann. I mean, yeah. all of them, they, they were like icons to me. So I was like, I, I knew I was doing something incredibly special. I I was so proud of it. I thought it was so relevant. I loved the fact that it was scary. I loved it. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it's not, see, it's interesting. I, I spoke to Victor about this too. I don't know. I haven't spoken to him since he saw your production, but you know, I don't know how audiences look at it now. I don't think they're scared of it. I think they should be. <clears throat> I think they no, don't. They, I think when you did it, they were like, how dare they? Yeah. And now they, we feel like, yeah, we're ready to fucking criticize what, uh, um, you know, what crazy white people in America sometimes have done. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, but I, I loved every minute of it. Stephen. It was the greatest, it was yeah. the greatest experience, theatrical experience of my life. By far. That's pretty awesome, man. That's pretty awesome. Well, I'm really happy to talk to you. And uh, you are I'm such a joy. I, I, I'm now, I, I now, will, I now will hound you, and I will do it through Adam Gettle because that's uh, he and I are close. And, Great. And you're such a pleasure. I'm such a fan, and thank you Thanks, so man. much for, for doing this. Thank you uh, for having me, and uh, good luck uh, in Tennessee, where um, they're turning back the clock 150 years. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to bring you out here, though, to turn the clock. To put all, we can, the all we can do is fight, right? All we can we'll do is put, fight. We'll put, the we'll put the clock forward. Yeah. I'm coming. Here I come. Love to your wife. Thank you, my friend. I will we'll be in touch. And, and again, thank you for doing this. Much, much okay, appreciated. All right. Talk soon. Okay, pal. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Well, come back, Julie. That What a great interview. What a great man. He's terrific. Wow. Were you like, I know you were, you were belling all over, belling all over. I can't hear you. You're, you're muted. I you're could muted. not stop laughing. <laughs> He's funny. I, I was literally like this the whole time. <laughs> He's so funny. I mean, He's oh. funny, he's charming, he's talented, he's smart. And he's, he's all the things. And the the idea that he's faking singing, I, I want to know where he learned how to sing, where he learned because I'm a you know, I'm a voice pedagogy nerd. And and right. you know, and so I want to know like how that placement happens. What I want to know all those things. So No, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. When he said he was, you know, he didn't think of himself as a singer. And and he's and I can look. I can tell he's a tremendous actor who oh, set yeah. up things. So he approaches it as an actor and then sings. But but you're right. That voice. I mean, <laughs> it's it's up there for me with like Anthony Warlow. Like yeah. it's just perfection. Well, you heard what I said. I you know my mother's <laughs> probably turning over at me. She's not better than Gordon McRae, and he's, she's <laughs> doing it with that Pennsylvania accent. He, he came up with. right. The Yince the Yince accent. <laughs>
Anyway, uh, he's not joking uh, about that, by the way. I did I did Titanic at PCLO, and I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> it is it is no joke out there in Pittsburgh." <laughs> Let's talk about um, what we have coming up. Uh, very briefly, you've got you've got your cabaret series coming up. That's right. Uh, there's Miss uh, Kristen Cheddar. Well, first there's Sam Harris on July second. Get your tickets. It is, it's at TPAP. We're doing it on the stage. The whole audience is going to be on the stage at cabaret ta tables. MC John McDaniel, who was the Rosie O'Donnell MC, he was MC, uh, MC when we did um, uh, Andy Get Your Gun Up Already. Amazing. Sam Harris, incredible singer. He's July 2nd. And then we've got, uh, uh, after that, uh, um, Jason Graw and Liz Calloway. They're in August. Then we have Kristen Chenoweth, September 10th. And then the incredible Judy Kuhn is in October. Get your tickets for the Cabaret on stage at TPEC. It's gonna be a great time. They put a bar bar on the stage, the Cabaret tables, you're, on the, you're in, the, in the Jackson Hall, which is this 2,500 seat theater, but you're on the stage close to the performers. It's really fun. And then we've got uh, our season, which starts with, look at that, we're on the road. We're starting with Aida, Elton John and Tim Rice's Aida in concert. And that's gonna be at T Tennessee Performing Arts Center in the Polk Theater. And then we're doing um, a Christmas Carol, the one-man Christmas Carol with Mark Cavis. And then we're doing Smoke on the Mountain, the Tennessee musical. We're doing that at this uh, 1800s uh, Methodist Church in Franklin. And then we're finishing up with the Dolly Parton brand new musical called To Hear You Come Again. It's a great season. Go to studio10.com, get your tickets, go online. Julie, what a great show. Congratulations again on the book. Oh, thank you so much. I thank you. Wait, I'm very I can't proud wait of to it. read it. You're, you're just so special. <laughs> And uh, and we'll be back. And uh, we'll be back in next month. And we've got uh, a lot of good stuff coming up. So Can't adore wait. you. Adore you. Adore you too. And I'll see you in July. <laughs> okay, Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye.